Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Patrick E. McCoy, and it's such an honor to be here with you uh, for this Black Kickoff to Black History Month. And I want to say to you just uh, from the beginning, uh, when I'm talking about um, the artists or different things, you're going to hear me say the term Black and African American. Those are going to be interchangeable, so I just want to let that know that these are two interchangeable. Uh, terms. Again, I am Patrick McCoy, and we're here for this Blacks and Classical Music panel. 
Now you probably wonder, um, why is there a need for a blacks in music panel, blacks in classical music panel? Many times we hear about other genres and things like that that African Americans participate in, but not often the times that you would hear um, reference to African Americans in classical music unless you're really in that field. And so today, um, under the, the aegis of the Coalition for African Americans in the Performing Arts, um, I pulled together three of my good friends who operate in this realm of classical music. Hey, can I talk to you all like we're in the living room? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes we pull panels together just to make a point, but these are three of my friends that we all uh, met in, a, in unique, different ways in this, this area. So I want to start with my friend Andre Graves who's going to be coming at, at this discussion from the angle of arts management. I met Andre when I was uh, on my journey um, of interviewing famous classical music artists. And one of the famous artists I admired even when I was in high school was his sister, the world-renowned mezzo-soprano, Denise Craig. But it, it turns out that Andre and I, you know, would tend to, you know, uh, communicate much more on Facebook and things like that, and we built a friendship between us, not just on the, the, the premise of his, his sister and things like that. But I want to talk to uh, talk to you. He's going to talk to us about being an arts manager, being a brother in classical music, and what happens sometimes when he walks in to organize these events with his sister, or, or whatever the case may be. And they might see Andre, but they might see other things. You know, his athleticism, his height, and <laughs> all of that. So I'm going to save some of that a little bit next. So welcome, Andre Graves. You know, when I'm out and about in the Kennedy Center at Strathmore and, and just interfacing with different arts organizations, I get to see a variety of people. And it's wonderful when I get to those events sometimes. I say, hey, I see somebody that I have a similar likeness to. And one of those people is Michelle Fowler. So Michelle, uh, and if I mess up some, I'm, I'm talking extemporaneously, so I hope I don't mess up anything. <laughs> but Michelle is a singer, a conductor, an arranger. But I most of the time see her at the Kennedy Center when she's conducting those children of the gospel. <laughs> And I want to come in this conversation with her from the standpoint of, this is like the triple threat right here. She's black, she's a woman, and she's a conductor. But not only in the realm of classical music, also in gospel. And I'm sure sometimes that is, uh, to, to juxtapose all of that is a, is a chore, but also a blessing. And so I want her to bring that forth. So welcome, Michelle Fowler. And last but not least, this is my soul sister. <laughs> you know, it, it's one thing to meet different people uh, in, in the performing arts, but you know, you, you find people that really you connect with. And Robin has played in my orchestra uh, at my former church, Viola, uh, many times. They just uh, wonderful musician, uh, and so I want her to talk from the standpoint of being an orchestral musician of color, and also how sometimes that interaction might be when she's in the ranks of the orchestra, because sometimes it's not always expected that you're gonna see someone that looks like her and so glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> and just one more thing, you might see on the materials, um, and I might have to do this now, on the materials it might say uh, violinist, it might say Violas. Can we get clarity between those two issues? Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm Robin. Um, the difference, in a nutshell, between the viola and the violin, the violin is tiny. It's the soprano voice of the string family, and the viola is the alto voice. So I like to say it's the chop of the orchestra. I play both, so I kind of switch it between the two. Um, 
but my primary right now is viola, but I do, yeah, I do both. So. Thank you for that clarification, Robin. Matthew. <laughs> oh. And so right now, just as a little, a little warm up, and of course, I'm Patrick D. McCoy. Uh, just a little warm up. We're going to look at a clip from a favorite documentary, of my, a documentary of mine. This is an excerpt from the documentary Baroque Duet. And just to give you a little background. First of all, Baroque. When I'm talking about Baroque music, has anybody raised a hand and tell me what composers come from that period of music, the Baroque period? Panelists, you're excluded. <laughs> Huh? Bach. Bach. Thank you. Who else? Yeah. Who? Yeah. Handel. Telemann. All right, Leo. Thank you. So, those, so this uh, clip that you're going to see is from Baroque Duet. It features soprano Kathleen Lavell and trumpeter Wick Marcellus. Now, Wick Marcellus also does uh, jazz, but he also plays classical music extremely well. So, in this documentary, Kathleen Battle and Wick Marcellus joined together for this recording. It's a video, and it's also you know, a recording. And it's called Baroque Duet, so if you go to Amazon or go to some store that still sells CDs, <laughs> uh, you, can go and, you can go and find it. So um, Nora J, who's assisting me today up there, he's going to play the first clip, and this will be our warm up. ensemble that she wore at the concert on Sunday. <laughs> Now they move on to the same clip to their first rehearsal and meeting each other. You got me now? Yes, indeed. <laughs> I just, I mean, I, I just like listening to, to, to her, the type of expression that she sings, which you know, is instrumental. We're always trying to get to that kind of clarity that the program is there. It's like in the early jazz musicians when they played trumpets and saxophones and stuff, they would try to sound like the singers in the churches or the blues singers. And then when the instrumentalists get to a certain level of expression, then the vocals imitate them. See, we don't let that point yet. <laughs> so I really, I really want to just get a chance to stand close to so I can hear when she's raising stuff. I can get, 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 get
close to it was to a certain level of expression that will be compatible with what she's doing. She's, she's on such a high level that uh, I can wait for years to recall the so that get down to it. Now, some of these people that she's interacting with, like right here, that's the famous conductor John Nelson, who conducts the Orchestra of St. Luke's. So, so are, we, are we rehearsing today as well? What? I need, my, I need to get my intonation together. Okay, yeah, let's just. You know, I'm nervous. I need to get mine together. I need to. I'm nervous about this. Stand up here beneath the sound. <laughs> so, I need to really get my intonation together so we can work out some things also. And just go like this. Oh, this is the one that played. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to play the pretty here? Rehearsal. You have to have rehearsal. Imagine she would have been out, you know, on the stage singing that pretty area, and she would have, you know, run out of air. The rehearsal did what? Let her know where and so she could correct it and all that. But the reason I wanted to start out with this clip, and we'll see um, the other two, and um, the reason I want to start out with that clip is because I want you to see the level of professionalism that goes. Uh, into music making, no matter what race or anything like that. Music is music, and everyone who seeks a career in music, they have to prepare it, you know, with the most, level, the highest level of excellence that they can do. So that's why I'm going to show that clip with Miss Battle and uh, when, and if I can have the lights up a little bit, so I want to start uh, dialoguing with the uh, channelists, and then we'll go to another clip, you know, as we, as I told Norje, as the spirit moves. So as I mentioned to you, uh, the three the three panelists uh, are going to come from three specific aspects. A lot of times you go to concerts and you just see the person performing, or you, you might get the final result. If you're a person that's planning program, you might get just the final result of inviting your guest. But there's much more to this. So um, I want to start with Andre. Andre has a multifaceted career. And Andre, I want to start with you. And maybe could you just give uh, the audience kind of insight of how you became interested in music and, and you know, the spark as a child. And then we'll kind of go on from there. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so thanks for coming out today. I'm very, uh, very happy to see the, the number of people that are in front of us today. I'm Andre Graves. I am the uh, older brother and special events manager for Mrs. Denise Graves. Uh, we started, uh, I don't know if any of you know our story or know Denise's story, 
uh, I would say that our foyer into classical music actually started sort of rocking. Denise went to Duke Ellington School of the Arts, and me and her older brother, they went to Duke Ellington. Yeah. And I remember the first day she came home, and she had been listening to Leontine Price. And she came home, oh my God, brother, listen to this. <laughs> and she put it on my stereo, and I had one of those turntables with like 18 speakers <laughs> everywhere. And there was this woman singing, and I was like, what is that? <laughs> Take it off. And so that's how she Anyway, so, and I like to also joke that I got this career started, and, and there is some truth to that. You see, we started as a uh, gospel group. When we were children with my mom, and we were the inspirational children of God. So I must have been about 14 years of age, and at that time, we had that interest in God and sex was there. And we were at church one day, and there was a girl that I liked. And I was like, oh my God, she's here. And so uh, I fainted as I was sick. I was like, Mom, I can't see <laughs> And so Denise, who was always behind my mother, always that one right behind my mother, here now. She's like, Denise, you have to sing Andre's part thing. I'm like, what? Sing Andre's part. And anyway, that's how it all started. True story, you can ask me. Uh, true story, so I never did get to go out with the girl. <laughs> but anyway, all right, so, um, so that's how it started. Uh, many years later, I find myself in a position now where I get to manage my sister. Uh, I do most of her recitals. I work with IMG artists who do her her operas. Her, but I do a lot of the recitals and a lot of the smaller things you'll see in the local area. That was not always the case, but I'm very thankful to be in that position today. Uh, Patrick sort of mentioned how I sort of transitioned into the uh, the business side of it. Uh, so early on in her career, she wanted me to do a lot of things. I just wasn't ready. I had a lot of play in there, I wasn't ready to, to take over. It's a huge responsibility uh, when you are managing someone's career. It, it's major, it's a huge thing. Uh, but about uh, a little over, about 15 years ago, I became heavily involved with what she does, and uh, I'm very thankful for it. I get an opportunity to represent her in the world today, and I take that uh, seriously. Thank you, Andre. Now I want to continue <coughs> with you, Andre. Sorry. <laughs> um, being kind of like the homegrown brother and sister that people here in Washington perhaps maybe may see you as homegrown right here. Um, but now, Denise, who is always uh, faithful to Washington, and so are you. But do you talk a little bit about sometimes when the fine line you, you have to kind of mediate, for instance, when you're planning uh, big events and say, make, say like, I'll, just, I'll use myself as an example. Let's just say uh, my church wants to have something or, or things like that. How do you make sure that whatever the event is, that the integrity of, of what Denise is worth? Or do you maybe donate time you know, for different things? Now, how does that kind of play out? Um, so, so that can be a little tricky. Just mm -hmm. so that can be a little tricky. Uh, we are a native Washingtonian, born and raised here in the D.C. area, and this is our base. Uh, but from uh, the perspective of management, uh, I can't have Denise performing everywhere. I can't because then you guys won't come. You guys won't come if you know that she's going to be at your church on Sunday, so you're not going to buy a ticket <laughs> to the Kennedy Center if she's there. So there's a fine line. It really, really is. And, you know, for the most part, I can speak say this for Denise. She loves this area. It's her home. Uh, we would sing at everyone's church if, if that was possible. And we would do so for free if it was possible. Except then when the Kennedy Center comes calling and say, hey, you were at Patrick's church for free, so come to our Kennedy Center for free. <laughs> then that becomes the issue. So it is a, we have to balance the two. Um, we do recognize a need get back to the community, to be part of the community that has raised Denise and supported her and sort of propelled her on to the greatest stages in opera today. We started here in D.C. So we do feel obligated to give back, to be part of it, uh, but also to realize that there is a business side of it. Uh, I just simply can't, we can't do every church. We can't, you know, 
even though we'd love to do that, just it is a business side of it. And by the way, Patrick sort of opened up with what you guys see. You see Denise coming out, you know, you see her on stage when she walks out in that gown and whatever she has on. I'm the guy behind the stage. You <laughs> never see me until maybe the, the signing or the meet and greet at the end of the day. Thank you so much, Andre, and thank you for being willing to answer that question. I know it was definitely a, a kind of a fine line, but I did it for yeah. But I did it for a reason because I recognize several young African American classical musicians in this room, and Andre so eloquently answered that question. And sometimes I see Dana, my friend, and things like that, and I see a few others. But I asked that for a reason. Oh, tell us. Okay. Yes. Um, I ask that because sometimes these budding musicians, if it were not for organizations like the National Association of Negro Musicians yeah. or organizations like the Coalition for African Americans in the Performing Arts, whose mission is to bring color to the classics, you wouldn't see these artists on the major concerts hall stages of, of these great halls, and they may not have a platform to excel in their art and be compensated right. appropriately. Okay? And what I mean by a pro, never mind. Oh, my All right. So I want to uh, go over here to, to Robin because you play in many orchestras. And one of the things I like about Robin is she's not one to, pardon the expression that you're a string player, but you don't toot your own horn, beep, beep. Um, a lot of times people see you and they, they catch your spirit, and that's an important thing too. But um, as I mentioned before, Robin uh, is in the orchestral world. And sometimes when you walk into these orchestras, uh, being <clears throat> African American or another minority, the reception is sometimes uh, different. So Robin, can you maybe just go back a little bit from that point how did you get engaged in classical music, and particularly as a string player? Great question. First of all, thank you so much for this event. Uh, I want to thank Kappa, I want to thank Patrick, Miss Perry, and, and my colleagues here. This is amazing. This um, is not something you see every day. Um, we all come from different walks of life, and to be on you know, this platform together to share very, with great humility our stories, our experiences, which some of which overlap, some are totally different. I think we come from the same spirit, um, which I'm sure we'll discuss later. But um, real quickly about me, I was born in Pittsburgh. Um, my mother is Jamaican, my dad is American. <laughs> so that already kind of flavors who I am. Um, and that's not something that um, I deny when I walk out on stage. Um, I always kind of know that I'm going to walk out on the stage and I'll be the fly in the ointment, or I'll be, you know, the the chocolate, the one chocolate chip in the cookie. I know that. I just walk in there. I know that, and I have to carry myself with dignity and with humility. But I also have to be prepared. I know that when I walk into a situation, I'm not going to show up. You know, excuse my language, but half-assed. I'm going to come in there. I will have to put in the work that I need to be to be on that stage with my other colleagues, some of whom are not as prepared as I am. And I will say that very plainly. Um, and that has no salt in it. I'm being very honest when I say that. Um, so going backward, um, my parents were never thrift. Um, my parents are both college educated. That in and of itself is a blessing. Um, but they worked very hard. They saw from I was five that I had this interest in music, and instead of ignoring it or you know brushing it aside, they really sacrificed so that I could um, pursue my dream, which was just to be in music. I, mean, I loved piano. I started when I was five, um, and then I found the violin. Um, there were some musicians who came to my school, and I saw them, and I said, I want to do that too. And you know, as a child, we don't think you can't do anything. So, um, you know, I talked to my parents about it. They made the sacrifice without telling me what they had to do to make it happen. I was probably playing on a fluorescent matchbox. I didn't even know what it was, but it was a violin. And they put it in my hand, and I worked really hard. They didn't have to force me. I just loved it immediately. 
and I was so shy, but I found my voice in music. So um, I think part of the importance of um, musical education or study pursuits of, with anything, doesn't just have to be music, is finding your voice and maintaining that voice no matter what setting you're in, no matter who's your instructor, um, you know, because a lot of people try to change that voice, and, and that's good. You know, we do want um, instruction and um, influences, but I think it's important to maintain who you are, to know who you are. Um, and my, you know, my parents exposed me to just classics and jazz and hip hop and everything. So, um, and then at a certain point, you learn to expose yourself to those things and seek those things. So. You know, my mom had the nerve to take me a little black girl to see the Nutcracker and high tall in Pittsburgh every year, but couldn't afford it, but they made it happen. And because I saw that, I felt that I could desire to have that for myself. So that's a little bit of Robin, I want to continue with you because you hit uh, kind of a hot topic in, 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 uh, in pop culture right now. Is it? Uh, relates to pay discrepancy and things of that nature. And I won't go too deep in that, but I do want to hit uh, something that you said. You walk into the rehearsal, you're far more prepared uh, than your, your other colleagues in the orchestra. And then when you get the check, what happens with that? Have you ever had a situation where you had like, well, just like the, I won't call names, but one of the stories, the, the uh, contract was left on the copy machine and the other colleague goes and you have to give it to your nose. But anyway, um, <laughs> they go they go to that copy machine, they turn it over and then you know that's just hypothetical. You know that there's a discrepancy. Have you ever had had a situation like that without going into detail? Absolutely. Um, I'd say in lots of different aspects of that has happened or something like that has happened. There have even been instances where I've signed a contract and never received a check. We've all been, you know, musicians, we've all been there. Um, how do you handle that? I think I treat any job where I'm playing um, as if it's the same, as if it's a million dollar contract. I approach it with the same integrity, the same dedication, the same passion, um, in my preparation. If I happen to be compensated in a way that I feel reflects, you know, rewards that effort, that's awesome. But I almost don't expect it because if I were to judge or temper my preparation based on what I felt my compensation would be, I'd be never get paid. You know, um, my goal is just to be a representative of myself and my culture, my family, my people. So I always hope that I and compensated to the point where I can support myself. Um, I'm a single mom. I want to be able to put food on the table for my child. Um, and I certainly um, accept certain work based on what I know the pay scale is. I'm also a member of the Musicians Union, the American Federation of Musicians, and I believe in fair pay um, and certain standards, professional standards. So. Um, I carry those things with me when I walk into a gig. Thank you. Michelle! <laughs> Michelle has many facets to her career, as I um, mentioned, and juxtaposes being a conductor, a singer, and everything else that's excellent in music. So could you maybe talk to the room about how you find balance in those things? Uh, say like when um, someone engages you as a conductor, how, how do you compartmentalize those aspects of your career? First, uh, thank you all for being here. Right. I mean, really, this is a packed house and it's great. Thank you to Katha and Terry, Patrick for having me here. And what I want to know first is why do I get the harder question? Welcoming <laughs> <laughs> question, but that's okay. Um, balance is something that I strive for every day because there are so many different elements of this music world that I am involved in. Um, you know, so I, I am a conductor and I prefer to conduct choirs versus orchestras, no offense. <laughs> um, 
it, but that's just my passion because I'm a singer. I also uh, am a classical recitalist. I'm an educator who does a lot of workshops, and I'm a pianist because mm -hmm. that's where it all actually began, and a lot of people uh, don't know that because I don't really try to push that as much. So learning all this music when, I, when it's brought to me, right now I have three concerts that I'm working on simultaneously. They're all in different capacities. One is conducting, one is singing, and the other is where I have to do a workshop. So I try my best um, because that, that is such a struggle. I wake up in the middle of the night and I hear music all the time because I've got all kinds of things that are running through my head and, and the ideas that are flowing. And so what I've, what I've been doing lately is just saying, Monday belongs to singing. Tuesday belongs to X, Y, and Z, so forth and so on, because if I don't organize my life, everything starts to roll together. And um, I, I have come to this place in my life where I have accepted that the Creator has blessed me with multiple gifts in this one area of music. And I'm supposed to utilize all these gifts in this lifetime and do them with excellence. And so I have to find, um, that's just my way of fine tuning how I can compartmentalize and be the best, be the greatest at what it is that I'm doing. Thank you, and I wanna continue with you, Michelle. Oh. <laughs> so as I kind of uh, intimated in the beginning, um, Michelle is just, just a wonderful musician in the sense that she has a lot to offer. But as you know, when you, for those of you who uh, follow classical music and maybe follow the, the, the great conductors, and as she mentioned, she does um, choral. So if you talk about choral, you might know the name um, Dr. Andre Thomas or uh, Joseph Flummerfeld, or these are all conductors. Uh, you might know, um, you know, if you're talking about the orchestra, you might know Sean Dutrois or Leonard Slatkin or Christoph Eschenbach. But it's not always often that you're gonna you're gonna find. You have let me change that. You have a lot of women conductors. You have a lot of black women conductors, but they're untapped and unknown because they haven't received the what the platform. Mm -hmm. And so it was important for me to have Michelle on this panel because we have talked about this many, many a time. So I want to go further with you, Michelle, and ask, when you're at the Kennedy Center and you walk out on that stage to a diverse audience, a matter of fact, um, there's a big concert coming up at the, at the Kennedy Center for MLK that involves the Choral Arts Society of Washington and the men, women, children of the gospel, and, and a plethora of artists. And Michelle is usually the, the third of that triumvirate of conductors, and she represents not only being African American, a conductor, but she's a woman, and she takes her rightful place. So I want to know, what does that feel like when you when you take those spots? Has it, has it ever been a time when you work with organization that they didn't necessarily expect that it was going to be you at the helm? Have you ever had a situation like perhaps like backstage and you walk around maybe in your regular clothes and then you get to that moment, then the person like, oh, oh you can <laughs> You can answer any way you want. I, I think that occurs a lot, mainly because when I'm in my my just daily garb, I look like a lot of the young people that I associate with. Y'all, I'm still young, don't you? <laughs> and so, you know, I have my hat on, baseball hat or something, and, and I'll blend right in. So from that perspective, then when I get into my attire and I step out on stage, they're like, oh, wait a minute, you, you are the person. Or even when I'm wearing my baseball cap and I step on that podium, it becomes somebody very different. So, um, you know, that's probably the only aspect it is, but I'll tell you the truth. Um, there is great pressure. What I do, this is a man's world, of what I do, no offense, bless you. But 
we are, and, and no matter what genre, because I'm also a conductor of gospel music, mm -hmm. and the reality is that as a conductor, you do not see a lot of females in these positions. And um, you don't see in the classical idiom a lot of black women who are standing on major stages and they're conducting. And you can really name the women in general, you can name them on two hands that are profile out there and get a lot of notoriety and they're not black, not one of them, but to speak for the whole group of women. So yes, uh, to think back even a little bit more, I, I come from a background where both of my parents are from Jamaica. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and uh, in the household, uh, growing up with these very old school West Indian mm -hmm. folk, they came to America with the mentality of raising their kids with a Jamaican mentality. And they used to tell us all the time, we are not from here. <laughs> and how we operate is not under the American culture. And so for West Indians, education, academia was very, very important. So whatever we wanted to do, my parents were wholeheartedly supportive. So if we wanted to be the best garbage man, they were all about giving us the opportunities and the platforms that put us into the position that would align us with being great. And so, um, you know, when I step out on those stages, I have a tendency to remember my upbringing mm -hmm. and to remember that my parents instilled into us that in the greatness of achieving it, practice. And making sure that every single time that I step out, I am representing my level of artistry that when I step off the stage, you remember what it is and the name that I carry. Even though you might not know I'm carrying Fallon and all that comes behind it, but that is what I hope to leave in the music that I'm conducting, or singing, or playing, whatever. Thank you. Andre. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about, um, even though you, you were raised in a musical um, household and things like that, and your interest as an adult have uh, grown since then. I want to know, how do you um, find balance in your interest in fitness and music? And perhaps when you may be talking to another, uh, a young classical musician that might you know, meet you by way of Denise, uh, maybe like the importance of fitness in being a musician as far as your health. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> oh, that's, I'm sorry, do I need to go into another one? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that there, again, speaking to the balance, I want to go back to say something that the two other panelists have talk, talked about that, um, that's important uh, that we get out here. So, uh, growing up as children, it's the parents, you know. So we grew up in the very meager beginnings. We grew up in the hood, in the hood, in the projects, with white cereal boxes and those types of things. You guys, some of you will get that, if you know what I mean. And so we were, my mom, my mom was a single mom, and she, uh, she refused to let us become products of where we were growing up. We would do our homework, we went to public schools, we went to homework, and after we did our homework, we were like, can we go play? She goes, no. <laughs> go get a book off the, get an encyclopedia, read me something, and write me some, oh, this is terrible, we have the worst chocolate ever. <laughs> but in fact, but in fact, you know, I'm so thankful for that, that today, because that has brought us to a place where we, uh, you know, a little sister and I would be presidents and kings and queens. And, you know, I've been afforded some luxuries that some of those kids in those neighborhoods have not. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of work to get there. And you've heard both of the panels talk about that. And so that's one of the keys to it. Now, uh, one of the other things I do, I wear many hats. Besides being special events manager for Miss Denise Gray, I manage fitness centers for uh, the U.S. government. I manage fitness centers uh, for the Center of food, uh, food Safety and Applied Nutrition in College Park, Maryland, uh, one of their locations down in uh, Dolphin Island, Alabama, and another not far from here on Murphy Road. 
Uh, I think that fitness, as when it compares with anything you do in life, it's important to be fit. If we're not healthy, if we're not, you know, there's some elements that that is true. That itself can, it can destroy where you are, your career. For, in this industry, what we do here, uh, there are many, many long hours <coughs> on stage and rehearsal halls and that type of thing. And often being in shape and being fit is, is a key component to that. Denise, I know, spends every day at the gym. I call her off and what are you doing? I'm on the treadmill. I mean, you can hear her when she's breathing and that type of thing. And so I think that there is some sort of connection between that and anything you do in life, Jim, right? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Did I answer it? Yes, you did. And see, when you have such an eloquent parent, it's just going around on it. So thank you. Can I answer it? Yeah, she may. about this all the time, and I speak it, uh, to them from the standpoint of what gifting God has placed within you, and by the way, I don't, um, every choir I direct, there's not a gospel choir in front of me, but when I do speak to them, I have to speak to them from what I know and believe, and what I know and believe is that God has given us this gift of music, and we have to be able to live to the level of anointing in which he has placed. Mm -hmm. And all of that is inclusive of how well you take care of your body. Mm -hmm. So, especially to my singers, uh, I'm, I'm always, I have private students, and I'm always talking to them about the benefits of working out, changing your diet, and not doing it. I get people who say to me all the time, I'm getting ready to do a recital, what should I do? And it's two weeks from now. Well, why don't you just change your mindset in general? and live in a healthier lifestyle so that when you are towards that recital, you're already in the mode of what your body is accustomed to, the health benefits that your body is reaping, so that when you get there, it's all the better. It's better than where you would have been if you just never did a thing and then waited for two weeks right before. Mm -hmm. Get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now we're gonna move on to the next clip, of a little excerpt from this documentary. Uh, uh, for those who came in um, after we started that part, but this is Whitney Marsus and Kathleen Battle in the whole rehearsal process.
first time we played it, did that happen? We first time we ever worked together was this cantata in 1984. That's the first time I ever played classical music live. I mean, seriously. Was it really? I'm serious. Oh, wow. I'm I proud to have been there. I was so nervous, boy. I said, Lord, just let me know. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of. Oh, you were cool then. <laughs> I was yeah. That's right. And you were doing anything for fake. I was there, I was like, yeah, I'm cool. <laughs> 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 so, I'm not talking about playing seriously, something professional. I had played a lot in concerts, but I mean, I had been playing jazz for a long time. Now, do you like your brass a little on the, the more side or dry? I like the right in between. <laughs> You want that one? Oh, they they want to go. Oh, you got it. Thank you. 
try to get, to get to the feeling of the music more, you know? I was trying to think of that last night. But you gotta have something specific in mind when you, when, you know, when you're playing some music, you gotta have something specific in mind in terms of the kind of... Well, I mean, even, even, I'm not talking about that, that, that specific in it. I mean, I'm not talking about the emotion of the text. I'm talking about the emotion of, of the music itself. Like, what kind of feeling I'm going to try to play with. Kathy, what you about that time? Well, I'm thinking of two measure phrases. So it might even be a little quicker than that. I think I, when I first started out, I said, So in this rehearsal dialogue, we could all agree that you you observe excellence yes. in, in the music making. So I want somebody to, to be a volunteer. I, I already put my, my colleagues on the spot, but I want to put somebody else on the spot who will be willing. There was one thing that was a constant in this rehearsal process. You saw it prominently, whether it was going across the music or it was, or it was behind Miss Battle's ear. What is that crucial thing that you must have in anybody's rehearsal? Yes. And if you're in a position of mentoring young musicians, or even in your church choirs or your community uh, choral situations, it tells the conductor and the musicians around you a lot when you don't come with the what? A pencil. A pencil. If you notice, she was marking up that music. So now when they get back to this, they're, they're not having to what? Go back, they're not having to repeat. So that's very important. So as you impart wisdom on these young musicians that you interact with, you know, they can bring their voice, they can bring their instrument, they can bring their scores, but it's kind of irrelevant if you don't have that what? That pencil. So that was something that always jumps out at me. Because I've been at the other end when I'm in a choir, the conductor has repeated this stuff over and over again, and I was, I said, oh, I remember it. And then I got the wrath of just, something I didn't need to get. So that, that was something that, that jumped out at me. So, I kinda wanna break this up if you like. Can I, uh, is there anyone from the, in the audience who has a specific question for myself or the panelists? Um, I have a few questions, but one of them has to do with this book I'm reading called Blacks in Classical Music. And uh, one of the reasons why I read this book is because it was a discussion of what's the black voice. Does it exist? Is there such thing as a black voice? So as a, a, a string uh, player or as a vocalist or conductor, I mean, and certainly in the transition between classical and gospel, that uh, question must arise. Yeah. Does it exist? It exists, absolutely. And um, so I have my master's degree in vocal pedagogy. And um, one of the most interesting things uh, in any, anything that you're breaking down and learning about are the, the, the physiology of the body and how all of the muscles work together and the tendons and the bones and how very different our bodies are shaped <coughs> from the black voices to the white voices and it, it is completely different. First of all, our collarbones. The density of black bones are a lot thicker. And so, um, and I was just talking to my students about this the other day too, because they were asking, I have an array of students. I have Asian and white and um, Hispanic and black in uh, my choir. And uh, the one white uh, female said, I, I don't have vibrato and I want to. And so we got into this discussion about why it came so naturally 
for the black students who were present, and I will say students of ethnic background, period, to have it. And so we talked about the level of density that was present or lacking. And yes, it can be teached, and the black voice is prominent, and it is there, and it is um, respected. And I would dare say, because I never read that particular book, but I definitely would like to read that book that um, you have there. Um, that the voice is not limited to, correct me if I'm wrong, just the physicality of sound, but they're talking about also the black voice, the, the its presence within classical music, correct? I think yeah. the question could be um, interpreted a lot of ways, uh, but I think specifically we're talking about uh, physicality, yeah, because that's where we always get in trouble, with Serena Williams or whatever the conversation is. Is the black body a different body than the rest of the body? Yeah. And if so, is it a good thing? It is a good thing. And I mean, I think on both ends that you can find your challenges and you can find the, the positives um, for this. You know, there are some black voices where the vibrato is just so overwhelming, they don't know how to control it. Um, you know, and they branches out into things of tremolos and, and wobbles and everything else that comes with it. And so, you know, you have your pluses and your minuses, and it depends on um, the area in which you are trying to use your voice, your gifting. If you descend to, uh, decide to sing as a black uh, voice into an a cappella group, I'd probably be a little bit more careful because a lot of a cappella singing requires tones that are are, are straight tones, depending on the, the music. And, and we have a tendency to have a difficulty pulling back um, uh, our sound uh, in order to blend with uh, what's around us. So there's, there's, there's so many more things that I think I could really answer to that question. <coughs> that satisfies it. If I may interject, I'm, I'm glad you offered that because uh, Part-time, I teach at my alma mater, Virginia State University in Pittsburgh, Virginia, and I was just talking to uh, my colleague, Dr. Savage, about this very thing. When I first heard Kathleen Now, I didn't know that she was black. All I knew was I heard this lyrical, precise <coughs> voice, and let me just go, go, ahead, go back and give a little clarity. I would say one of my greatest musical mentors is white American. His name is Dr. James M. Peake Jr. And after school, high school, he would always invite me to his office. And every time he invited me to his office, I would always leave with a recording. And this is where not only did I hear great uh, standard singers like Cecilia Bartoli or some of your other uh, European singers, I heard some of the African-American singers who I didn't know were, were out here singing oratorial and opera, like Denise Grace, Marietta Simpson, and of course, Kathleen Battle uh, being among them. But I'm saying to you, when I first heard it, I wouldn't have said, I oh, wait a minute. And then it was a PBS special came on, and Kathleen Battle's likeness now is there connected to the voice. Now to get back to the nuances of the black voice, you know, it's been times, you know, when I heard Kathleen Battle, you know, it sounded pristine and all that. But it was something that I knew was, oh, that, that, that nuance that she did. And I could, I could feel the soul. I think they mentioned that somewhere. I could feel the, the soul of it. So, and, and I think it's a very um, fine line in that discussion because some, some people may think, uh, you know, like I'm not going to sing poor game best because I don't want to be group, you know, or pigeonhole or I mean, things like that. And some of you uh, may be familiar with uh, poor game best and things like that. But I said all that to say, I think it's, that's a good discussion and I think it's one that is kind of, and Michelle, thank you. I think you really hit the nail on the head on that. But um, I think some nuances, if, let me just say this, if you're in a group, and I, I'll speak for me personally, uh, my mother was not uh, a classically trained singer. She sang a lot of spirituals and she sang a lot of gospel. So when she heard like Kathleen Battle or some of these other artists for the first time, she was like, oh, what is that? Black people sing like that? So sometimes you have these kinds of discussions, but as she saw me being involved in this stuff more, she, you know, got an appreciation, you know, for the different style. And just to end this point <laughs> is that um, 
Yes, Kathleen Battle or Leah T. Price and other people, they might be um, African American, but they excel in all the genres you know, across the board uh, with excellence. And I think that's the undercurrent there is excellence. Whether you're singing spirituals, whether you're doing crossover, you know, all of these, especially when you're representing the black voice as a black artist, uh, all of them have to be done uh, with excellence. Uh, Nora J, can we get the... There's a question right there. Okay, question. Yes. I can record it. As a person who grew up in a household with gospel music and R&B, jazz, and hip-hop, and go-go. Um, how can we as a community and as families encourage children and, and these grown folks? I'm, a, I'm, I'm not an aficionado of classical music. I'm here because I was curious. How can we encourage our, our children and our communities to not be so intimidated by classical music and maybe tie that into the music that we're really familiar with, like go-go and hip-hop and gospel? Is that for me, that question? Okay, well, I'll jump in and let, let my parents jump in. I think with an organization like this one, the Coalition uh, for African Americans in the Performing Arts, and if you don't know anything about it further, there's literature on the table out at the reception, which we will all enjoy. But this organization has done a great job in melding things together, and maybe I can, I don't want to put you on the, oh, um, melding things together, like they have a, uh, an afternoon where they have young mentors. Oh, thank you. They have uh, young protégés uh, in the community who have performed with Kappa, and they go into the schools under the ages of Kappa, of Kappa and they, they write their own operas, and they do rap and all this stuff, and then they present it before the public. So, it, it, it's, so then it doesn't become such an austere art. I have to have on my bow tie and sit in the front row perched and look at people on the stage and they look stiff or, or whatever the perception may be. Now these young people get an opportunity to be a part of the music making, a part of the artistry. Now they are uh, the artist. And so um, I think that when you mentioned about gospel, um, there's a wonderful DVD that I saw um, a few years ago that features uh, Ms. Graves, uh, Denise Graves, it is, uh, I want to say it's called Church. And Denise is the focal point of, of this performance. But you have all of these other musicians, like Patti LaBelle and, and the choir. And it's, it's a, a whole um, array of people of different genres. So I know that if I was in that concert live, I would probably be like, oh my god, I want to be a part of that. You know, because it, it was such a variety. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question or you wanted to go either further or... Yes, thank you, Robin. <laughs> um, as an instrumentalist, um, particularly a string player, um, I can say that, and I'm a millennial as well, um, I, there's so much online. Like A lot of us kind of think of classical music in this box where we have to go to a concert, or I have to go to the Strathmore or the Kennedy Center or... Um, the Meyerhoff in Baltimore, but there's so much online um, available. YouTube is an amazing platform that has propelled a lot of um, young artists to the forefront. Um, there are so many um, who I could just rattle off. I'll name some who are home. One who's homegrown is a good friend of mine, Chelsea Green. I'm sure some of you have heard of her, but I mean, we were in grad school. Well, I, we were in grad school together in Baltimore, but she has since now she's a professor at Berkeley College of Music, and she's um, and you she know, was here in the right. And so she's a local, you know, uh, personality who we can hold on to, um, not just because she was um, she's not from here, but she you know uh, developed the beginning of her uh, career here, I would say. Um, but she's someone who crosses over um, the lines between classical and hip hop and jazz, and so we try to put music into these boxes and genres, but music is much more fluid than that. I think to speak to your question about the black voice, what is the black voice? It's, you know, it comes from our history, um, if I could say that. I mean, I think we all carry a certain degree of um, 
there's a mystery about where we came from, but there's also a sense of, I know what my struggle was, the struggle of my people, the current struggle of my people, um, and collectively and you know across the board, across the waters. Um, but yeah, Chelsea Green is one. Um, I am one. Kevin Jones is one. He's sitting back there with his cello. I mean, we all do that. I think when you go to a concert hall and, and you are with someone or you're by yourself and you see a brown face, go up to the stage and talk to that person. I am the least uh, you know, confrontational person. I will be inviting, I will give you a hug. I hope that someone will come and say, how are you, you know, I, I look for kids, I look for kids. So I can say, do you like music, do you play, do you play in school? You know, why are you here, who are you here with? So we have to engage as artists, we have to put down the glass, you know, we have the stage and we think that the people on the stage are not approachable or, you know, not tangible, but yeah, walk up to the stage, talk to those people. <coughs> Daniel D, he's another guy who has a huge platform online, go on Facebook, look him up, I mean, he does these little videos where he's just rocking out to hip hop, and that's just one way, but classically, a lot of these people are classically trained. So they're not leaving the tradition of classical music. They may just be making it, you know, more familiar. Um, and what's the first thing I turn on when I get in the car? It's not the classical music station. I listen to straight ahead jazz. I listen to hip hop. I mean, that's who I am. I listen to reggae. That doesn't mean that I don't listen to classical music or have the same sensibilities. It's just I'm more we all are more diverse than we think we are. I think we just have to not be afraid of stepping into boxes that may not look inviting, but you may, I was always taught you make yourself at home wherever you are. So if you're in a setting that, you know, you may be the only brown face, go walk up to someone and say something or make yourself, make your presence be known. <laughs> what I would like to do now is move uh, to the final excerpt from uh, this documentary, and then we'll take a few more questions and we'll close it up. You've been a great audience. <laughs> this is when she goes to her hometown of Portsmouth, Ohio. And take note of a few things as you watch this clip. Sister. Kathleen Brown. 
a Soprano superstar uh, comes home. Mm -hmm. We're here. <laughs> She put that idiot in there right there. <laughs> she 
you keep it, you can go. the video. Um, did you all pay attention to that? So sometimes you have a family and I, you know whereas you have many different gifts among siblings but sometimes it's one sibling that's necessi not necessarily thought of to be the musician. Now you, when you um, listen further back when they were in church if you didn't know this you probably would listen to the higher voice Straddling up, thinking that it was who in the church service. But it was not Kathleen, it was the sister. And so, in that moment right there, if you saw how, uh, not to say it was negative, I just noticed a different energy when she said, out of all of the, of the sisters, who was her, which her sister was? Carol. Carol was the one who was thought of to be potentially a singer. It is no resentment there, but sometimes you have that that kind of dialogue in um, in any any family. So I thought that was that was quite interesting. And I wanted to go back and have a conversation too. A lot of times, whether you're uh, a violinist, a singer, or what have you, and you've gone off, gone off to these prestigious institutions like Shenandoah Conservatory of Music, <laughs> or Curtis, or any of these other oh, conservatories. Wow. And then when you and then when you come home, what your family sometimes hear or expect is not necessarily what they get. So I'll just give you a short short order story, and then I'm gonna open up a few more questions, and we'll close it out. When I was a student at Virginia State as a music major, voice major, my mother used to hear me around the house singing because I used to try to replicate these opera singers that I heard and all that. And uh, my mother like, boy, if you don't knock that noise off, what are you in there singing? Because as I mentioned to you before, my mother sang gospel. And my mother went home to be with the Lord last year. But, and I give glory to her because that's why I stay here today. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so she, she sang gospel and I was raised in the church. So sometimes I always wonder, like, how did I find my way outside of this and singing these anthems and concert spirituals and things like that? But she would say, boy, not all, all that noise. But the turning point for her as this turning point was 
my mother supported everything. Even though she might not have understood the genre or but she supported everything. She always, you know, my mother was a custodian by profession. So sometimes when she was in the community, that people would see her in the context of keys and opening doors and cleaning up or whatever. But when mother put on her clothes, <laughs> oh my word. You just thought she was up there supposed to be singing a all of y'all. <laughs> but at any rate, her turning point and when the light bulb really went off for her was when I sang my junior recital. And it was a much different because I came on there with my peacock feathers and my stride and all of this and all of that and <laughs> acknowledging their couple. But when I opened my mouth, she was so shocked that what she saw me working on at Virginia State was not what she heard where when I'm singing and screeching in, in the bedroom. And she cried. And from that standpoint, she it was just more with intensity that she supported um, all of my events. So that, every time I look at that little sequence right there, and, and I don't, we don't have the rest. I don't know if it's the rest, but I know we're running out of time. The video goes on where they're talking about uh, the different grade schools and how the community formed a center, no matter what you do, whether you're a musician or whatever. Uh, it was saying how the, how the community for the center, and it was nothing that you could do without the parents finding out about it. So then the three sisters are in the car singing gospel. They sing a Jesus keep near the cross, that's a familiar gospel hymn. And so that's where they, 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 they further carry this story. Do we have any other, oh, Dana, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. I know these are some of my friends. I've played, I'm a, I'm a concert pianist, and I've played with them. I'm so thankful uh, that Kappa, that you have put this on. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> I think this is so powerful. And I can't wait to do a part two. We need to get some young people in here because what you all are giving are treasures. And I wanted to, I know we're quick on time, but I wanted to follow up on what you said. I'm from a small town in Ohio, just like Kathleen Battle. And it was interesting to watch some of the dynamics. She got sang all over the world and, and being in that situation, it's interesting how it was perceived. And I wanted to kind of speak to and have you all talk about how we make it relevant for our young people. I think you started the conversation off. Some of them are looking like, mm -mm, I don't know what this is. You know, I, I have played at church. I'm, I'm from a Kojic, Church of God of Christ, hand clapping, foot stomping, devotional. And I can play all of the Bach and Beethoven and Chopin, and they'll entertain it. When we want some, you know, you play good, but girl, you need to learn some of them. You know, and, and I know like with Kathleen having those nuances, because sometimes you gotta work hard for black folk. I ain't gonna lie. You know, you got to lie on the piano. You know, it's just, Knowing that, and so how is it with our young people, a lot of them now are not having the church experience. So a lot of those spirituals, they don't know. Uh, we, we did something where a lot of them do not know Leontine Price and Catherine Battle. They know Rihanna, they know Beyonce, and they know a lot of the singers who, yes, they work hard, but there's no need to study the diction. Half of the songs, we don't know what they're talking about, you know? <laughs> and so it's like, how do we make it relevant to, to educate and make it also accessible? I started at three because my mother, she sang with the caravans traveling and she saw that people train their kids. The money, for I started with Suzuki. Our, our, a lot of our parents don't know what that is. They start their kids six, eight. By then, I, I started at three. I'm already a head start. And where do they get the money? Who's taking these kids to all of these lessons and the summer camps they're locking? So being mindful of that and how do we make them Feel like they have a presence. You know, when you go to the Kennedy Center, they had Herbie Hancock. Mm -hmm. A lot of their seasoned members were walking out with their hands over their ears at the Herbie Hancock, and I was very offended by that mm -hmm. because it's, it, it's like we don't have a place. So I know that was a whole lot, but how are we making it relevant, uh, relevant for our young kids to see that they have a place, and how do we make it accessible for them? Exposure, exposure, oh, right. exposure. Mm -hmm. our, we have a responsibility as artists to. Um, educate and um, this is one of the great things about being an educator that I get to influence and impact the lives of young people now I'm a traditionalist in you know all I had I'm a black woman but God gave me classical music 
you touched on the point about the black church. I can tell you honestly, <laughs> and black people, this is the honest to God truth of Michelle Fowler coming at you. The hardest place that I have ever had to yes. sing was for the black church. Yes, yes. Because I was given this gift of classical, and they didn't understand it. Yeah. And so now, as I am older, and I get it, I, I get the, the, the bridge that needs to be built for that understanding. But I also believe strongly in not trying to give it to them, and, and, and y'all can disagree, I'm sure people will disagree, and that's okay. I don't want to give it to you in the sense that I've got to um, bring rap or hip hop yes. for you to get it. Yes. I yes. want you to see the beauty of this classical yes. music, of the music yes. in its purest form. Mm -hmm. And so I have to bring it to you. Yes. I have to show you the exposure. I force my kids, mandate them, it's a grade in my class, that you have to go out into the community, Washington, D.C., we are blessed to live in this area that has so much with art. They don't even come and see a, a gallery of this magnitude, but they have to. In my class, you are mandated to do it. The parents have to go with them yes. to do it because I know that a lot of these parents yes. don't have the exposure themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is forcing, a, a, one, a family bonding right. to happen over the arts and a community involvement that's taking place in my classroom, in the community, and outside. I just think that we as artists have to do more to engage our young people yes. into just, just the purity and the beauty of the music and learning, allowing your ears to adjust to something other than yes. hip hop, yes. rap, yes. trap, yes. and whatever else. <laughs> Do we have any other observations for the panel? Okay. Can I just interject? Yeah, we'll move here. Once more. Um, I think Sister Michelle has hit the nail on the head. Thank yes. you, Dana, for that wonderful question. Mm -hmm. I can talk all day about this, <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> um, what I will say is that we have to stop thinking of classical music as not our music. Yes. It is yes. our yes. music. Yes. I mean, yes. go back to the foundation of the world. Who were the first people? I, I can go on, but I won't. <laughs> what I would like to say yes. is that let's see. Yes. <laughs> Let's seek out artists, you know, who don't look like us, but artists who do look like us. There's a great, uh, they call him the Black Mozart. Yes. Well, it is yes. George. Yes. I mean, he was a virtuosic violinist and prolific composer. This man's music is gorgeous. All you have to do is Google him or, or look him up on YouTube. You'll hear his concerti, you'll hear his symphonies. Um, he was, you know, just an amazing character uh, in history, and I think that a lot of times we start trying to fit in. You don't have to fit in. Yes. You don't have to blend in. Be yourself. Be proud of who you are. I walk on stage. I might be the only one who looks like me, but you will see me because I'm unapologetic about who I am. Yes. And that comes from my upbringing. That comes from the suffering that I've had in my own life. I've suffered a lot. Dealt with what we all have. But you carry those stories. You don't yes. put them aside so that nobody sees them. That's what makes your music sweeter. That's what makes you a more compelling artist yeah. and, and person who can actually connect. Music isn't just about technical proficiency, it's about connecting and communicating a message that just like you know, um, Whitten was saying it's, and, and Kathleen, it's not about the notes all the time. It's what happens between the notes. Yes. And what, what makes them leap off the stage, it doesn't have to be perfect, it has to be genuine yes, and exactly. um, actually real. So th those are just my thoughts on that. But we can continue that later. <laughs> I think, uh, how are we doing on time? I think two three. So I'd say we can, um, two or three more questions. I think that's a bit too much. Can we can actually, uh, this one and right here, we can close out with these two, okay? Okay. Hi. I am actually a visual and performing artist. And I've had many great musical adventures with Robin Massey. She's a fierce musician. Uh, but I want, yeah, I wanted to, and I've worked in the Caribbean and the UK and Asia, and I work multi genre, and I'm super excited. And this is actually a question directed to our director, Kappa. They have, I don't know if people know, 
Um, there is an outstanding program where Kappa is um, uh, combining musical talents with the Korean Cultural uh, Center, and I want to know how that came about because I've worked in, in, in you know, in, internationally, and I'm about forging these multi-genre partnerships. So please share this wonderful program details of how it came about. <laughs> I don't want to take away from the panel, and, but um, I want to introduce, on behalf of Kappa, I want to introduce our Reach International Outreach Coordinator, Benita D. Raise your hand, please, Benita. What Benita was able to forge for us on our behalf was several uh, partnerships and collaborations on an international level. Uh, the Korean American Cultural Arts Foundation is one of them. We've partnered uh, uh, informally for about the past two years, but we always intended to do something on a more formal basis, which led us to Soul to Soul, the Korean American and the African American musical extravaganza. That's next Saturday, next Sunday at four o'clock at the Public Playhouse. So we'd like for all of you to purchase a ticket. Uh, I think they're $25 each. You can purchase them online or go on the website and get the phone number. But that was one collaboration. The second one that Benita helped to forge was one with the, um, the Embassy of Angola. And we'll be doing a program, this will be the second year we're doing that program uh, as a partnership with the Embassy. Another um, collaboration that we had on an international level was last year, we partnered with the Bahamas Tourism Board and with the Consulate General, and we did the first ever Blacks and Classical Music Cruise. That was called Ari Is at Sea. Yes, yeah, some of you have, may have uh, heard about it, but uh, we are planning another one. We'd like to invite all of you to come aboard and on the high seas, as I like to say, high seas, the high seas. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but, um, so that's our international outreach program. But Patrick invited you. There's some literature uh, in the other room, and we'd love for you to take that home with you and, and just browse and peruse all of the other things that we have. And I just want to thank our yes. panel. You've done a wonderful job. Patrick. Yes. And our moderator, yes. Dr. Dean McCoy, who's been absolutely fabulous. Yes. And of course, yes. for Sonia Kitchens and my career at Art Center for who are hosting and presenting this uh, for the community. Yes. So thank you, I'm gonna give the mic back to you, but thank you so much. One oh yes, okay, one other program. One other program that we have, uh, it's at the Kennedy Center. That will be on uh, May the 2nd. It's on the Millennium Stage. It's a program called On One Accord. You know, in the, in the, uh, the mindset of collaborating with other cultures, it was my thought process to put together something with the Jewish American community and the African American community. So we have Ariana Zuckerman and Isakaya Savage who will be performing on that yeah. stage. And we've already gotten the approval. Thank God, you know, God is just so good. Yeah. We're going to be doing three programs next year at the Kennedy Center and just, wow. instead of just one. So we're very excited about that, right. those programs. But more to come. We need your help. I'm always looking for volunteers. <laughs> so uh, not to make this into a commercial, but I, th I thank you all so much for helping to bring color to the classics. Yes. Wow. Terry was, just very quickly, Terry was uh, naming um, the artists, of course, our friends with all of them, but she mentioned one, Ariana Zuckerberg. Uh, Ariana is a fabulous soprano, but the reason I really make mention of it, she's not one of these artists that, that rides on the reputation of a famous parent. Her father is the famous um, uh, uh, Patrick Zuckerman. And so the reason I really bring it up right now is because the other day on Jeopardy, he was the question. Right. You, don't, but you don't think that you're going to see the person on Jeopardy, but oh, I know them. You know, so, so anyway, I just want to say thank you all for your presence. And I just want to say that the. Uh, oh, what is it? One more question. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, and I told you you were going to question. My bad, my bad. First of all, I want to say this is absolutely great. You guys are wonderful. I want to see part two, as someone else said. Um, back to the question of trying to get the young folks involved. Um, Robin, I'm not sure, did you do my concert, for instance? Um, you know, we do different genres of music as well. 
last one last year was at Strathmore where I had a 60 piece orchestra play with Larry Graham and Grand Central Station. Did you? I was not involved with that, but I have seen you before. Oh, okay, okay. Well, we did the same thing with Bootsy Collins. And I run a nonprofit that gives musical instruments to kids. And so that's what we do. But we put the different genres together. The idea is, like you said, keep the music pure. I love that. What I try to do is, for instance, the orchestra will play first and probably play something very classical that the audience is like, what the heck is that? But it's pretty good. <laughs> you know, and then, then they'll do something, the orchestra will play something a little more mainstream, and then we'll bring in. The orchestra will, will, will play, we write off the score for 60 pieces for Bootsy Collins or something, and, and they do that. And when we're success, successful, kids get instruments, but, but we try to bring them into that type of thing. So, and I'm also contracted to do uh, probably five uh, uh, programs with PBS, so I'm going to talk to all of you about that, because we're, we're trying to get things for coming up with that. But uh, I'd love to talk to all of you, but this is absolutely great. I want to work with them organization as well. Okay. Thank you. So can I share something very quickly before I give, give them their, their props? This is actually part two. In 2014, the Coalition for African Americans the Performing Arts invited me to moderate a panel of this uh, statue, but it was a different configuration. We had the, the interjection of a composer who makes their living, uh, Stephen Allen, and you may have heard of the soprano, Melissa Hudson. I'm forgetting who the next, the next person was, but that panel that I moderated was at Prince George's Community uh, College. And so this is kind of a, this is part two, so let Terry know, the executive director, that, that, that we need the, the part three. <laughs> yeah, that's part three. But um, I'm not the spokesperson for the coalition, but I've been on the board of the organization and have a wonderful relationship with Terry. So on behalf of the Coalition for African Americans and the Performing Arts, whose mission is to bring color to the oh, okay. So the mission is to bring color to the classics. The mission is what? To bring color to the classics. And you gotta sing the color <laughs> to the classics. <laughs> but I want to take a, a brief moment and then we'll have our representative from uh, Parks um, to come up, but I do want each panelist to stand and receive their, their due. Violas, Robin Massey. Kim Becker, Michelle Fowler. You may be And that's not me, Audrey Gray. And I, the moderator, Patrick and McCoy, the after the music. And I just want to say, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to say one thing uh, that I didn't get an opportunity to, to, to talk about. I'm just going to be very brief. So it would be naive of us, and I know none of us believe that there's no racial tensions in classical music. That's the landmine of the room. You know, typically when you talk about that type of thing, it's like committing suicide for your career. It does exist. We know that that exists. But it takes more of me, it takes more people like me who get in positions where they can uh, affect change. You know, so there, there's all sides of things that Patrick and I sort of talk about and didn't get a chance to speak to today the discrepancies among artists, especially in the black community. Doesn't exist, you absolutely correct it exists. Um, but those are some of the things, that we need more people like me who are behind the scenes just as well as we need them on the stage. A lot of powerful things, a lot of wonderful things are happening. Uh, the, the crossover of some things, uh, we're participating in a gospel, most classical thing, where we're getting more young people who are just getting them, making them aware of what we do. That type of thing. Uh, and I, this is not a commercial thing, but Denise and Bibi are going to do something in June. And that's a wonderful opportunity for those in the gospel realm to see what Denise does as well, and likewise reverse. So uh, we hope that we see more of those things. We love what Papa's doing, and I'm very excited to be a part of this. And looking forward to the things to come. Thank you. Thank you. 
I know we have power, but. You guys have a good time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So let me just say, Montoya Arts Center is one of four arts facilities with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. How many of you all live either in Prince George's or Montgomery County? Okay. So if you are homeowners, this is your taxpayer dollars at work. Yes. So this is what we do. The Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, in particular the Department of Parks and Recreation for Prince George's County, is one of the largest arts presenters in the county, in the state actually. So we present arts programming all throughout the county, all throughout the year. And so when you talk about how do we do this, how does this happen, it really happens through relationships. Because this partnership actually formed when I met Ms. Terry Allen. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm the director here of Montpelier. So the decision making comes on me. So it falls to me, it falls to making relationships, it falls to getting to know people, but it also comes when people present programs of integrity and high quality. So not only do we present programs, we present programs that are high quality. So that's important, that's important for us. It's important that we give you all your money's worth, give you all your time's worth, and so it's very, very important. So don't forget that, and don't forget as we were talking about earlier, the educational aspects. So one of the reasons why we do this program is that we can engage with the community. <clears throat> and also, Montpelier Arts Center, um, in particular, does a variety of genres that are necessarily accessible by everyone. We have a classical music uh, series. We also do straight ahead jazz. You don't see a lot of young people in these programs. And we also have a program entitled our Jazz Talks. And that program is to further these kinds of conversations so the public who think, I don't know anything about jazz, can come out and have conversations and engage. So it's not so daunting, because I know a lot of what we talked about is that people feel like it's inaccessible, but it is accessible. Mm -hmm. We were talking about Chelsea Green. Chelsea Green's been here twice. I also presented her at the Public Playhouse. Yes. Um, but we also present lots and lots of artists who come through here that people may not always have a chance to see. So make your voices be heard. Form your relationships. Keep doing great things. Keep having high quality performances. And buy tickets. Buy tickets. Buy tickets. Buy tickets. Because we as an organization believe in paying our hearts. So I know that there are some people who say, oh, but you get exposure. I know artists can't eat exposure. I know that artists can't, they can't pay their mortgage for an exposure. So I would encourage you all to continue to support the arts. People are supporting lots of other things, but support the arts. It's very, very important. So on the final note, every year we here at Montpelier Arts Center do a classical competition. So we invite people from all over to submit and uh, submit entries, and we present five to six concerts a year. So I have cards here. It's open to everyone. But we do not get a lot of applicants of color. So if you know anyone, 18 and over, who's interested, vocal, instrumental, we encourage you guys <laughs> to get the word out and let people know. And we have cards here. But it's also important, though, that you still maintain the diversity. You still know what else is out there. Because it's not just us. It's a lot of people out there. So I would like to tear it down a little bit. Oh. So, Terry, as she mentioned earlier, is the next director of CAPA. So this has been a wonderful partnership. Next, <laughs> um, next week, we are having Soul to Soul at the Public Playhouse. That's another program of CAPA. So, um, but if you would like to purchase tickets for Soul to Soul, you may do them at the front desk. Downstairs here. So we encourage you all to do that. We'll continue with great programming, great partnerships. Come back and see us. I love what we do here at the Maryland National Capital Park Planning Commission, and we're happy to do it with CAPA. And thank you all so much. It's been a wonderful, wonderful time. And not just because it's Black History Month, though. Not just because it's Black History Month. These kinds of things happen all along. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a connected, how many, um, you know, formally that want to refer people in the county to? Oh, Danae is first. You're in Howard County? I'm in Howard County. Okay. There you go. <laughs> All righty, so. <laughs> we have some stuff we do in a fabulous show. Yeah. 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 So, so
mentioned earlier, there's a reception next week featuring the artists who are in these three galleries. So we invite you guys to come back. And just keep us on your radar. If you want to sign up for our mailing list, but not just for Montclair. All of the arts facilities within our department are doing great, great things. Get yourselves out there. We offer classes here. If you want to do ceramics, painting, drawing, we're a multi-faceted arts facility. But it's thanks to people like yourself. So following this, we have a reception that's sponsored by Catholic. So get yourself some refreshments, network, pass out cards, exchange phone numbers, take selfies. Have a good time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 